Okay, back to business. Uh, last lecture, there was a question of whether the, the Green's function was vector valued when the unknown function was vector valued. So the electric field is the unknown function here. Uh, that's vector valued. Is now the Green's function vector valued? And uh, it's hard to stand in front of the blackboard and try to figure out the answer, but it's very easy when you get back to the office. So the answer is that the Green's function is a scalar, because if you look at this integral, or you integrate over the Green's function and the sources, well then you see that uh, this term is a vector, right? And uh, similarly, this term is a vector. So that takes care of the vector nature. So as before, the Green's function is just um, determined by the operator and the boundary conditions. So if the unknown or the source functions are vectors, well, both the unknown and the source function should be vectors. So that takes care of the vector business. Any qu more questions on that? No? OK. So back to, back to the scalar potential. So we have this expression for um, the scalar potential. I'm now, now going to try to find an approximate expression for this 1 over r and an approximate expression for this e to i r uh, plus and minus. And then if I start off by looking at this r plus minus, and I have the approximation that d naught is much less than r, well then I can simplify this expression by uh, Taylor expanding the square root. First of all, I neglect this term because it, this is small and this is small squared, so it's really small, so I neglect that. I keep only this term, and I tailor expand the square root around um, uh, the origin. This gives me that r plus minus is approximately equal to r1 minus plus a half r hat d naught over r. There could be more terms, but those terms are going to go like 1 over r square, which uh, does not give rise to radiation, so I'm just going to skip that right away. Note, by the way, that r hat d is equal to d cos theta. So this was just the cosine law. OK. Uh, I can further, uh, well, yeah. If I now have 1 over r plus minus, which I have down here, I can write that as a Taylor expansion again in well, 1 over this. Um, and uh, similarly, I obtain 1 over r, 1 plus minus a half. Uh, yeah, so I flip the sign essentially. Uh, plus minus a half r hat d naught over r. And again, if there are higher order terms, they're just going to not give rise to any radiation, so it's not interesting anymore. Um, this, by the way, is from 1 over 1 plus x is approximately 1 minus x plus x, um, x square plus so on. But x is much less than 1 in this case, so we just keep the first term. Okay, so that's the approximation we got from the size of the sources being small compared to the distance to the sources. Furthermore, we have that d naught is much less than the wavelength of the emitted light. And this also means that d over lambda uh, is more or less kd is much less than 1. Uh, and now we can tailor expand the exponential. So we tailor expand uh, the e to i omega over c r plus minus. And now we have an approximate expression for r plus minus down here. And I tailor expand this to see what I get. And e to i k r plus minus is approximately e to i k r. Oops. r is simply the distance from the origin. And one more term I have to keep, e to minus plus i k d naught 
halves. Um, let's see. And k vector is simply k r hat. And the length of k vector is omega over c, as before. Uh, now this one there's not much to do about, but this one I can Taylor expand uh, because uh, KD is much less than one. So it should hopefully be enough to keep a few terms. Let's do that. So E2 I K R plus minus is approximately E2 I K R, which is essentially the factor just from distance from the sources to the observation point, and then 1 minus plus i k d halves. And uh, if you go to higher order, then you get k d square, and since k d is much less than 1, those terms can be neglected. Now if I insert these approximations for 1 over r plus minus and e to k, k r plus minus into the potential v down there, well, then we get the following. V of R T is equal to something that should hopefully be a bit simpler. Q naught 4 pi epsilon naught e to I K R minus I omega T. And two terms e to I K D naught half over r plus minus e to i k d naught half over r minus and then finally inserting for these two uh, I will get let's see an approximation q naught or 4 pi epsilon naught e to i k r minus i omega t over r, because that's the dominating term here. Uh, in fact, wait a second. Yeah, okay, we keep that for now. Um, and then the brackets become 1 minus i k d naught half. 1 plus r hat d naught over 2 r. One of these is from the exponential, this one, and this is from the 1 over r plus. And similarly, we get two factors from the second term here. 1 plus i k d naught half times 1 minus r hat d naught or to r and close the bracket. Yeah. Now you see that we get some uh, terms that you have 1 over r times 1 over r. So we can skip even more terms. Um, and uh, also we get d naught square terms, and those terms should be small as well. So when we um, neglect those terms and the dust settles, we should end up with something like this. Uh, let's see, Q naught, yeah, perhaps to clarify, D naught square neglect, and also 1 over R square terms we neglect as well. So Q naught or 4 pi epsilon naught e to i k r minus i omega t over r. I will get from the first term, let's see, we had to keep, now, we had to keep uh, not only the one, but also the next term because you get one times one minus one times one, so the ones actually cancel out, that's why we had to keep the next term. So we get minus i k d naught plus r hat d naught over r. And uh, if I make some space, 
I will arrive at the final expression. Let's see. Okay, so I will just write that up here, right next to the initial expression for the potential. V of R T is approximately equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught e to i k r minus i omega t. And then we get minus i k r hat p naught over r plus r hat p naught over r square, where we recall that, uh, let's see, p naught is equal to q naught d, uh, d naught, right? That's the dipole moment at t equal to zero. <coughs> okay, now we see that this term here, Term number one. Well, that has an one over r dependence. It goes like one over r for large r. So this is the radiative term. Okay. While the second term, well, that goes like one over r square. So it's the static term, or uh, well, if you have a dipole that's not oscillating, this is essentially that potential. So it's a static term. Okay. And if you take the real part of this uh, expression, you will get the same expression as you found in the textbook. But uh, as always, the complex notation is is very convenient. Um, yeah, you could also note that if I let omega go to zero, that's no oscillation at all. Well, then k will go to zero as well, and you will recover the static dipole expression for the potential. Uh, while in the radiative zone, term two will go to zero, and we get the following. So we get. V of R T in the radiative zone is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. When I write this rad here, that means radiative zone, so I skip all the higher order terms. E to I K R minus I omega T over R. And an extra factor minus I K R hat P naught. Note that this is an outgoing spherical wave. This term here is an outgoing spherical wave because it's traveling radially. It's decaying because of this term here, uh, factor here, with an angular uh, dependence. which comes from the dot product here. So we see that if I sketch the setup again, set axis plus Q of T minus Q of T and the observation point. Now, uh, P naught, that's this vector here. That's Q times D naught, right? or q naught d naught, uh, while this is the vector here, r hat. So this angle theta comes in there, meaning that this will give me a cos theta. Okay? Uh, and this is crucial, of course, because the 
derivative with respect to r is going to give me one over r squared terms when I uh, find the electric field from the potential, while this gives me something for the electric field that does not decay as higher powers of r, meaning that I actually get out radiation from this system. Now we can note that kr minus omega t, well, if you write that in terms of the retarded time, I get omega over c r minus omega t is equal to minus omega t minus r over c, uh, sorry, r. Uh, by the way, the, the big and the small r is equivalent now because we're in the radiation cell uh, is equal to minus omega tr. And if I um, introduce the tr, then I can write the potential even more compactly. The v in the radiative zone is equal to minus ik over 4 pi epsilon naught. <coughs> r hat p of tr over r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And this is simply a time derivative. Let's see, so I can write that as r hat p dot of tr over rc. So if I evaluate this, <coughs> yeah, this is omega over c, right? So uh, you can write it as the time derivative. So the time derivative of the dipole moment at the retarded time gives you the potential in the radiation zone. And uh, finally, P of TR, well that's simply P naught E2 minus I omega TR. And since the derivative with respect to T and uh, Retarded t is the same. Then um, you can simply say that okay, a derivative is simply a minus i omega, and omega over c is equal to k. So that's how you get here. Uh, okay. Next step is of course to get the vector potential a because we need both the scalar potential and the vector potential to determine the fields completely. So I think we're leaving the scalar potential for now. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, I have a question on lambda and scalar, and then could you separate that from k? So the question is about this p. Is it p or the time derivative? It's the time derivative of p. Uh, that's where you got this uh, minus i omega from. Yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. Also because this is tr, you see that d dt is equal to d dtr. It doesn't matter which one I differentiate with respect to. Anything else? Okay.
Okay, so to find the vector potential, we're obviously going to need the current density because we need to integrate over the current density to find the, the vector potential. Now, the current density I can write as follows. Well, perhaps first a quick sketch, plus Q of t, minus Q of t. Uh, the Q of t was equal to some constant and a harmonic time dependence, like that. Um, and this is the vector d. Now, what's the current density? I can write it as follows. G R T is equal to dq of t dt, d naught hat. So the current is proportional to the change in the charge localized here and here. Time, and it's going in the direction d naught. Let's see, like that. It's um, localized to the set axis, so it's delta x1, delta, well, delta x, delta y. And the theta of d halves minus x3, wait, I think I mixed x1, uh, x3, and set x. Let's see, set like that. The time derivative will simply give me an i omega, as always, when you have harmonic time dependence. So it's minus i omega uh, q of t d naught hat delta of x delta of y theta of d half minus set absolute value. And theta, if, if you don't know what that is, well, that's the heavy side step function. So theta of x is equal to 1 or 0. It's 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0. And it's 0 if x is less than 0. Meaning that this guy here looks like the following. This is the set axis. This is 1. Well then, it turns on at minus d half. So the function goes like this, and it turns off at plus d half. And continues off being zero, meaning that we have a current flowing from the one point charge to the other point charge. Uh, this is of course required by the continuity equation because charge can't simply disappear or uh, reappear. It has to actually flow around. Uh, if you recall, uh, let's see, dt of rho is equal to minus the divergence of j. So charge um, density variation has to be countered by a flow of charge. So that's the principle to find this j. Okay. Now uh, we know that when the source is not moving, we can simply write a of r t as an integral of the Green's function, but you don't need to call it that if you don't want to. d3 r prime j o r prime t r okay. over r. And r is r minus, well, the big r is small r minus small r prime, as always. And if we insert our um, uh, j, we get, well, the integral over x and y gives essentially nothing, factor of 1. So if I uh, skip into it a bit, this gives me minus i omega mu naught over 4 pi d naught half d naught half d set prime q at retarded time because we have a retarded time here, over r, and d naught hat, which is, by the way, equal to set hat, to take care of the vector direction. OK, uh, and now in this r, we know, of course, that r prime, or uh, yeah, we're integrating over r prime here, right? 
but this is simply zero, zero set because the, um, uh, the delta functions uh, here make sure that we stick to the set axis in this setup. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So because this is now a simple integral, I will just skip to the result and um, uh, and we have that a of r t in the radiative zone is equal to mu naught over four pi. And then p dot of t r, where I use the same derivation trick to get the i omega into the um, dipole moment, uh, divided by r, the distance from the origin. So now we got the vector potential from an infinitesimal oscillating dipole. And um, if you want, you can write this time dependence in terms of the time now, which is what we want in the end for the electric field. So e to minus i omega tr. You have that inside here, right? You can write that as e to minus i omega t minus r over c is equal to the now famous factor e to i k r minus i omega t. Um, yep. So p of t was p naught e to minus i omega t. That's this guy up here, except in this expression it's evaluated at retarded time. So p at retarded time becomes P naught e to i k r minus i omega t is equal to p of t. If I gather this and this factor, e to i k r. So this gives me simply the phase from being a distance away from the, from the sources. While this is uh, the dipole moment at at the present time, not the retarded time. Uh, okay, so now we know the scalar potential, we know the vector potential. We can easily determine the electric and magnetic fields from the standard approach. So I won't uh, do that now, but I'll save that from, for when we look at the general source distribution. And um, instead I'm just going to quote the pointings vector so S time averaged, the brackets mean time averaged as, as before, is equal to one half E cross H star, where the star means complex conjugation, so I goes to minus I. This is proportional to the factor omega to power four uh, sine square theta over R square and it's pointing in R hat. Okay, so um, you see that the pointings vector depends very strongly on the frequency of the oscillating dipole. This sine theta gives me the angular dependence of the radiation pattern. And this is exactly what we wanted when we um, started out because we wanted a, a field that could carry energy to infinity, but uh, the energy shouldn't increase as we move farther away. So it's exactly right. Now this angular dependence here, if we sketch that, this is set and we have an angle theta to the point R. So if I now just sketch something like this, so at various angles theta, this is the magnitude of S. Okay, so we see that there's no radiation going in the direction of set or minus set. And this explains the Brewster effect, right? You recall uh, if I shine light on an interface, you have E field oscillating like this. Well then if the E field here 
if the dipoles in the material start oscillating like this, well then there's not going to be any field coming out in this direction because that's this direction here with respect to the dipole. Okay? So this is uh, the source of the Brewster effect. And note that, by the way, that this is a donut shape, right? Because um, we have rotational symmetry around the set axis. So this looks more or less like a donut, uh, except the hole in the middle is really small. Um, yeah. And if you want to find the total radiated power, we can just integrate over a big sphere. Uh, so the time averaged power will simply be dA times the pointing vector at large r. And um, in that case, uh, this r square counters the r square in the integral, the dA. So uh, that takes care of that business. OK, uh, just to mention, we could also have magnetic dipoles. Let's say I have uh, a loop of current like this. And I have a, a current I of time. So I have a, a closed loop. I run current alternating directions harmonically. Well, then we also have accelerated charges. So we would expect some radiation to come out. Um, uh, in fact, the dipole moment, the magnetic dipole moment of this loop as a function of time is simply I of time times the area. So let's see, I uh, have an area vector A like that. Um, then if we do the same approximations, uh, the current density looks different. There's no charge density, so we get no scalar potential. But you get a lot of vector potential. Which is i k mu naught over 4 pi r cross m at retarded time over r. So I don't have time to go into the details, but it's, it's essentially the same calculation. It's, uh, it's all done in the book, so um, I don't see any reason to, uh, to go into those details now. You get the idea from the electric dipole. Yeah, by the way, there's uh, this one thing. If you compare the radiation power from the uh, electric and the magnetic dipole, let's say P mag, divided by PL, magnetic over electric trans, um, let's see, radiated power. That should go like M naught over P naught, where this is the magnetic and electric dipole moments over C square. And because C is such a large number, this is much less than one. For, uh, so if you have a comparable size electric and magnetic dipole, the Electric dipole is typically a much stronger radiator. Uh, and this explains, uh, let's say, a lot of antenna designs if you look carefully at those. Now we're going to move on to uh, an arbitrary source of finite extent. And um, it might seem like a waste to calculate this dipole stuff, but in fact we'll see that the uh, dipole term is going to be what dominates the, uh, the radiated field from uh, an arbitrary source.
All right, so let's finish off the lecture by beginning the discussion on arbitrary sources. That's the next topic. Okay, so we, we're going to assume um, a source of finite extent and with, uh, so I can always, let's say, uh, make a sphere that will contain the whole charge distribution and current distribution. And uh, let's also assume harmonic time independence so that rho of r t is equal to rho of r times e to minus i omega t, which is the time dependence, and same for the current. There's a spatial factor, and e to minus i omega t, like this. Um, yeah, and as we always do, after doing the calculation, we take the real part of the answer, and then we have the answer that you can actually measure in the lab. So let's recall the um, equation for the vector potential, which is what I'm going to be using now. In the Lorentz gauge, it's simply uh, minus mu naught times j, um, and that's in the Lorentz gauge. And the Lorentz gauge was essentially the gauge we chose to decouple the scalar and the vector potential equations. So we can write down the vector potential as an integral over the sources and the Green's function. That's simply d3 r prime dt prime g of r prime r t prime t sources is mu naught j of r t and the Green's function is given by uh, minus 1 over 4 pi delta of t minus t prime minus r minus r prime over c divided by r minus r prime like that. So same Green's function as always. We integrate over the Green's function times the sources to find the vector potential. Uh, and uh, we get out from the t integration or the, or the t prime integration. We, since we have a localized source, the source doesn't move. So I can just perform the t prime integration because it's a delta function here. And I get out that A in space of time is given as mu naught over 4 pi d3 r prime j at r prime e to minus i omega t r because of the delta function integral over big R, which is simply this factor here. Uh, okay, I can now rewrite this as follows, e to minus i omega t r, that's e to minus i omega t, e to i k r, same as I did before. And now I can take the time independence outside the integral because it doesn't depend on r prime. And um, uh, let's see, I can simply write A of R and time as A of R. And by this I mean the result of this integral, e to minus i omega t, A of R being the integral, d3 R prime, j of r prime over r 
as usual, except now I also have to multiply by the factor e to i k r, which takes sort of care of this phase shift that we get from the sources being at different locations. Uh, you have a distributed source of arbitrary shape. So now I can essentially evaluate this integral as in magnetostatics, except I have to include this exponential phase that will take care of the retardation effects. Um, and I also would like to note that uh, with our assumptions for the sources, which is a, a spatial part and a harmonic time independence, I can, from the continuity equation, time derivative of rho is equal to minus divergence of j, I can determine that, well, this will simply give me i omega because it's a harmonic time independence. So let's see, rho is equal to i divided by omega divergence of j. Uh, I guess there should be a plus here, in fact. Okay, so because of this connection between the sources, I can determine the v or scalar potential very easily from the vector potential. So I will only uh, perform the calculations from the, for the vector potentials uh, in the following uh, discussion. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Now, so the integral to solve is this integral here. Okay. And to solve this integral, well, I can go back to uh, electrostatics and magnetostatics and recall that we had something called a multipole expansion. And this took care of this factor here, right? Uh, because the multipole expansion was as follows, 1 over r is equal to 1 over r, and then the sum n is equal to 0 to infinity, r prime over r is power n, pn of cosine theta, where pn were the Legendre polynomials. Uh, we note now that as I start summing here, we get r to increasing powers of n, meaning that, well, they're not going to be able to contribute to radiation. Meaning that I can write this as 1 over r plus terms of order 1 over r squared. And those terms are not going to contribute to radiation. So I'm just going to say that, okay, I'm not interested in those terms because I'm interested in the radiation fields. And then this is equal to this in the radiation zone, or at least approximately equal. Um, so we keep only that term in the multipole expansion for 1 over r. And um, let's see, then we can also expand this exponential which we got from the retardation. So e to i k r, that's approximately equal to uh, this is essentially the same as I did for the electric dipole, so I won't bore you with details, but it's 1 minus i k r hat dot r vector prime plus 1 over 2 r r vector prime square plus r hat r to prime square plus blah blah blah, like this. That's if I insert this uh, expansion here for R. Um, and then we see that, well, this term gives me a 1 over R. And uh, in combination with the 1 over R from this uh, big R here, that's 1 over R squared. So I can actually just cut off this expansion as well and keep only the first two terms, which was incidentally exactly the same as we did for the electric dipole. And um, yeah, so now if I insert this into the, um, into the integral up here, I will try to get some uh, expression for the leading terms, which are the ones that are going to, are going to contribute to radiation. So 
Let's see. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we can finish this if you give me five minutes extra. Uh, let's see. Uh, ah, we'll do it on Wednesday. <laughs>